according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. We're still in Ephesians chapter 2, working our way through 19, 20, 21, and 22, dealing with uh, the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Before we get started tonight, remember God is spirit. He must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Let's take a moment for silent prayer to prepare our hearts to worship in spirit and in truth. Shall we pray? Almighty Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and the privilege and blessing that we have to assemble together tonight. We ask for your blessing upon our gathering, your hedge of protection around us. Father, uh, more and more this world is getting darker and darker. But we thank you because uh, our light shines brighter and brighter. So, Father, uh, continue to bless your word and continue to bless our study. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, we do want to take some Q&A time tonight. If we have a microphone ready to go and a runner to volunteer to take that microphone. I believe we have no old business from uh, last week. There's one online. Would you like to start with that one? Okay, start with that one. Okay. Oops. John Carpenter. Uh-huh. A question regarding the imputation of Adam's original sin to all at birth slash conception. Um, sorry. Uh, having trouble seeing the top part, part of this one. This is apparently being challenged by Harwood, who suggests we are not guilty until after our sin, question mark. We're not guilty until when? After our first sin. And who teaches that? Harwood. I don't know that name, but okay. Okay. Yeah, so there's different ways to model that. And uh, depending on which passage you're, you're dealing with, I prefer to deal with a specific text. Uh, but, but clearly, uh, Adam's original sin has an effect. And I, I like to think of it as a corporate judgment that when Adam's eyes were opened, Eve's eyes were opened, their eyes were opened together as a consequence of Adam's sin, not as a consequence of Eve's sin. So she sinned first, but her eyes weren't opened until he sinned. And then the eyes of both of them were opened. And that's, I camp on that, and I, I, I really focus on that as a principle uh, because when we're gleaning, this is what you do with inductive logic, you're gleaning information from a, a, every passage you can find that, that bears on the topic. Um, and, and so clearly, Adamic humanity is under the judgment of God. In Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. And so, um, as far as the mechanics of when does that guilt get imputed, when does that, you know, is that physical birth, is that conception, is that is that um, at, with their first overt sin, you know, sin of commission or sin of omission or what have you, that's a pretty hard one to nail down and, and point a verse to it to pinpoint with that kind of specificity. Uh, and, and also, it's not, to me anyway, it's not entirely clear that, that God requires billions and billions of personal imputations every single time a child is born if, in fact, his first judgment on Adam was a corporate judgment. And then it's just going to follow that every human child born in Adam carries that, carries that uh, inherited sin. So um, anyway, that's a long answer to a short question. I hope it helps. And, uh, and I'll, I'll reach out to Mr. Carpenter. He's the new Grace Notes director, by the way, if you're not familiar with, with that. So we're praying for him and praying for Grace Notes and praying for that transition. All right, other questions tonight? We'll come right over here. There you go. I think it's in Leviticus 27:31, but it's the doctrine of the fifth, where a person buys his tithe back. Redeem part of his tithe, he shall add one-fifth of it. Wow, so what's that about? <laughs> That's curious. I wonder if uh, through the Bible says anything about that. Isn't 
Isn't it terrible when I have to search my own nose to say, what did I say about that? <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah, one-tenth of the increase was given to the Lord. Um, I don't know. I'm going to make a note on this, and it's the one-fifth edition that you have the question on. Mm-hmm. He's buying it back, so right. anyway. I'm going to add a note to and Wednesday evening. And it's Q&A. not in the uh, theme theological dictionary. Or it doesn't explain it out. Okay. Even as I call, recall. All right, I tagged it with a question mark, and I'll work on that for next week. Appreciate that. Yeah, and that's the other thing. You can open up the theme uh, Bible dictionary and search for passages there, too. All right, we'll go with the other side. Part of our bipartisan nature tonight, crossing the aisle. And I think 33 covers part of that as well, um, because it says one for every one-tenth that passes under the rod... So it's like you you you're giving away what you think of, that you're going to tie. Then you're like, oh no no no, not that one. <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah. I need that one back. <laughs> right. Um. So it may cover some something that you did not mean to give, but you gave anyway, and you're like, oh no no, I I need that specifically back. Okay. I'm just glad I'm a New Testament believer. And I'm not, I don't have to function under Mosaic Law or, or do, the, do the tithe or do the have-tos. Also, all the blood. Okay, yes, ma'am. Well, may I go back and clarify something based off what John said? Um, our sin in Adam is a corporate sin. So all are judged because one man brought sin into the world. Right. And, of course, Jesus, one man, took the judgment for all of our sin. Yes. So that's Adamic sin. That is Adam's end? original sin, Romans 5. Yes. So what about uh, from that point on? What were our personal sins? Just well, that's another prayer. issue. Right. So we don't go to hell for our personal sins. We go to hell. The unbeliever goes to hell because of the lost estate in Adam and the rejection of the gospel. Uh, but then as our works are we're accountable for our deeds and, uh, and accountable there, uh, that's, that's a separate question. And, and our works are evaluated even at the great white throne works are evaluated, those deeds are, are evaluated, so there's no equality in heaven and there's no equality in, in the lake of fire, and that there's, uh, there's uh, accountability uh, in, in both places. So we do have accountability for our personal sins, however, it is the rejection of Jesus as our Redeemer and Savior that would separate us forever and basically put right. us in hell. Okay. Right, right. And, and, and of course Jesus paid for all of them. He paid for the positional sin in Adam, He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that sin singular. But then also all of our iniquities, all of our sins were laid on him. So the, the, the personal sins were also dealt with judicially. There's also corporate sins that, uh, that were assigned to Israel. When Israel is a nation, their national sins in violation of Mosaic law, those sins were provided for on the cross as well. And, and the basis of those sins being provided for allows Jesus now to be the mediator of the new covenant when he returns at second advent. So, yeah, there's a lot of categories of sin that have to be delineated and, and kept distinct in understanding the work of what Jesus did. He also had a work that reconciled the angelic rebellion to some degree. We don't understand it, but it's mentioned in Colossians 1 that the blood of the cross also had a reconciliation value for the uh, angelic conflict. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Appreciate those. All right, we got time for maybe one more? A quick one? An easy one? Or a, or a short one? Or a long one? Or complicated? Anything? All right. Well, thank you for running the microphone. Appreciate that. Nothing else on YouTube? Okay. Well, we are looking at Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And it's, it's the recap. So then is the recap. And, and these, these final verses that close out the chapter uh, serve to recap everything from verse 11 onward and to really encapsulate the truth 
in, in, a, in, a, in a glorious way, describing through a metaphor the construction project that we all are in Christ, okay? Because we've, we've been built, we're being built, and we continue to, to be built, uh, you know, until this bride is complete, until this building is complete. And so the verb tenses are going to be very important for us as we break down the participles and the verbs and the, the different things that we have coming up in these, in these verses. Uh, and, basically, it then forms the bridge that launches us into chapter 3. Because chapter 3 begins with a for this reason, and that is building upon the whole doctrine of, uh, of chapter 2. So, um, just by way of reminder... In verses 11 and following, we have the contrast with what the Gentiles used to be and what the Gentiles are now, the new position that we have in Christ. And so, formally, this is what you were, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He himself is our peace, made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, and that's not the sin barrier between God and man. That's the racial barrier between Jews and Gentiles. But that's gone now. And that, that obstacle between Jew and Gentile, that hostility, that barrier, is removed in Christ. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that he himself might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Okay? And, and I... I emphasized that as much as I could. I made it bold. I put a green box around it. I colored it yellow, put it in all caps, added an exclamation point afterwards, so that you see one new man. This is, this is us in Christ. There's no longer the two with a dividing wall. You can't have two with a dividing wall when everybody is one new man, one in Christ. Okay? And this is the basis for the peace that we have. Now, for unbelievers, for, for unbelieving Gentiles and unbelieving Jews, trust me, that hostility is still there, okay? The Gentile-Jewish hostility, the Jewish-Gentile hostility, for, the, uh, for unbelieving humanity, that, that barrier is still there, that enmity is still there, because it's removed in Christ. It's only for born-again believers in the church age in Christ that we have that marvelous blessing of peace between Jews and Gentiles because we're both reconciled through the cross and the death of the enmity has been put to death. So then, all of that being true, this new creation that we have in Christ, the one new man, this new third circle, and I haven't shown that diagram for a while, so let's look at that one again. This new New Testament humanity. Okay? The fact that we now have a third circle. This is the one new man. This never existed before. And it's vital that we recognize that. That we are neither Jew nor Gentile, but we are a heavenly people, a heavenly citizenship. And uh, these principles are clear. Before the cross, Old Testament humanity looked like this. You had distinctions between Jews and Gentiles. And even getting saved did not end those distinctions. The fact is, is that whole catalog of, of disadvantages that the Gentiles had didn't matter whether they were saved or not. They were still without Christ, without hope, without, uh, they, they did not have the covenants, they did not have the promises, they did not have the Messiah. Their estate was over here while Israel was over here. So learning these dynamics, I think, is, is vital. In Ephesians 2, leading right into Ephesians 3, really coming out of Ephesians 1, where we say, blessed be the God and Father and every spiritual blessing that we have in Christ. Uh, so far, every chapter we've been dealing with in Ephesians has been just overwhelmingly powerful in terms of the positional truth doctrine, what it means to be in Christ. Okay? And every time you see those exclamation points, we're again fortifying the principle of being in Christ. In whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. That's in Christ. No Old Testament believer could have even envisioned such a thing. As well, in whom you also are being built together as a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's positional truth in Christ. So these, these, these things are, are vital. I don't mind slowing down. I don't mind repeating myself. I don't mind walking this through. 
And if you ever get lost in any of this, please, Wednesday night is question and answer night. Feel free to say, explain to me again that third circle. Explain to me again what this new man is, this church. Because it's not Israel. All right? Israel is Israel, church is church. And, and maintaining that clear distinction is, uh, is one of the, the sine qua non of, of dispensationalism. If, you, uh, if you've been studying that under Ryrie or whoever else. So, so then, you no longer are strangers and aliens. And that's just kind of a shorthand way of repeating, of, of not repeating the five things that we had back in verse 12. Just saying strangers and aliens and using that uh, uh, abbreviated uh, repeat to remind you, okay, that's not us anymore. But now, what are we? We are fellow citizens, the saints. Fellow citizens of saints, if you want to call it that. Um, take the cross off the word with, okay? Fellow citizens of saints, or the saints. And God's household. Go ahead and cross off the of there as well, okay? You are fellow citizens of the saints and God's household. The house of God. That's who we are as heavenly people. And this is more proof, if you need it even more, that we are not now spiritual Israel. The house that rules Israel is the house of David. The tribe that rules Israel is the tribe of Judah, okay? We are neither and the fact is that we start having priestly language in here, holy temple language, dwelling of God in the Spirit. More and more, we just have proof after proof after proof after proof that the church is something new, unknown in the Old Testament, that cannot be Israel in any shape, way, shape, manner, or form. Israel had a temple. In fact, they've had a couple of temples. They had a tabernacle. They had, uh, and, and these things just get destroyed. Okay? And uh, Solomon's temple, destroyed. Ezra's temple, uh, remodeled, expanded, becomes Herod's temple, and then it gets destroyed. And, uh, and now there is no temple. There's a mosque sitting on the Temple Mount. And, uh, but they want a new one. They want a third temple. And, uh, and they're going to get one. They will absolutely get one. Sorry about that. They will absolutely get a third temple. It's promised because that's the temple that Antichrist is going to defile. He will sit in that temple and display himself as being God. And so it's on the way. And don't be shocked if it gets built. Um, it could even be built in the church age. Doesn't mean, doesn't have to wait for the rapture for that third temple to get built. Okay? Anyway. Um, but So Israel had a temple. We are a temple. That's a huge difference. That's profound. As, as simple as it is, it says a lot in just a few words. So, having been built... And I want to pick up with this, and I want to kind of walk us through again the construction that goes on here. Because the, um, in, you know, if you remember in 1 Corinthians, uh, the metaphor was, was uh, farming, planting. Uh, he said, you know, I planted and other waters, God causes the growth. But then he switches to a building metaphor there also. And he talks about laying a foundation and another is building upon it. So you can freely mix and match these, these metaphors as long as you don't lose the doctrine contained in the metaphor that you understand what's happening. So this here is all construction, but not all the construction is the same. And so I think it's useful for us to, to focus on this. So when we talk about uh, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens of the saints and of God's household, and then we have this phrase, having been built. And I like that translation. Because that translation rightly communicates the timing of that building prior to. So the fact that we are fellow citizens and we are God's household, how did that happen? Now this aorist participle precedes the main verb, and it, almost like a flashback, but it shows us having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So having been built, that's done. That's a construction project that's over. That was a one-time deal on the day of your salvation. So when you believed in Jesus Christ and you, you received eternal life and you became a church-age believer priest, at that moment, one of the myriad of things that happened to you simultaneously is you, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. 
And so he, he fashioned you as a living stone and he put you into this body of Christ. And that's having been built. That never gets undone. That's permanent. You, are, you and I, we were all in this body forever. Having been built on the foundation. So that's, that's the day of your salvation. Okay? And that's finished. That's complete. Your salvation is a done deal. But now there's more construction on the way. And we're going to see this also. So this having been built, you might want to highlight this in case uh, you kind of zone out when I say things like errors past the participle. Um, pay attention to it in this point. Underline it. Make yourself a little note that having been built, errors past the participle, and then write the date down. If you remember the date, you may not. But whatever date that was that you got saved. Okay? And, and, and for me, it was a Saturday morning in 1973. And m my mother couldn't pinpoint it, so we don't know. We can look at a calendar and say, well, there were four Saturdays in that month. You know, any, any idea which one it might have been? No, not a clue. Okay, well, it just, we'll say it was the first one. Why not? You know, and it's close enough for government work. Whenever, you know, and I can point to that first Saturday in September and say, that's it. And write that date in there. That was when I was Eris Passive Participled built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, okay? And so now I'm in this body. I'm in this temple. I'm a stone in this temple. And that's when I got built right on in there. This temple, that, by the way, is still growing because people are getting saved all the time. And not only are people getting saved all the time, but then there's also a different kind of growth that's happening. And that's when we get into with verses 21 and 22. So what we're going to see is, once we get past the, the cornerstone doctrine here, we're going to see that, okay, the, the having been built is complete, but now we have being fitted together. That's ongoing. That's ongoing. And so, you know, a couple of verses earlier, we had the metaphor, we had the imagery of a stone being added and built on that foundation, and so there, that's done, it's a done deal. But what we find out is, is that stone doesn't just sit there, that God continues to work that stone and fit that stone. There's an ongoing positioning and fitting, being fitted together, and then growing into a holy temple in the Lord. I was trying to uh, use a, uh, I was trying to use a uh, 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 Legos, as a, as a illustration, which is kind of, I mean, we understand it because we all played with Legos as kids, right? We, we know what Legos are, or our kids played with them and we stepped on them as adults, and we, we know what Legos are. Um, but imagine you're building something out of Legos, and, and you're fitting the pieces together, but then as you're fitting the pieces together, those pieces continue to grow. How scary would that be, right? Oh, wait a minute. And you've got to make sure that this piece is growing and this piece is growing and this piece is growing. And think of that. Now think about the function of a local church as, as we're all individually growing, but then collectively, corporately, we're growing together. That's where the fitting takes place. And this fitting, this being fitted together, it goes so well when you're, when you're discussing the spiritual gifts in Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12 because it's the, it's, it's, those are the links, the joints, the, 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 the ligaments, uh, that which every joint supplies as the individual body parts are connected together. So uh, whether you want to use an anatomical metaphor of body parts or you want to use a building metaphor like we have here of stones in a, in a construction project, the idea that these stones are, are continuously being fitted that sounds a little abrasive, right? That sounds like maybe there's some rough edges that are getting rubbed, okay? My stone's rubbing against your stone, and, and you know, that, that tends to... Sparks can fly, okay? When you're rubbing stones together. I get that. But to God be the glory that uh, he, he does all these things, and it's a win-win, right? Because I'm growing, you're growing, we're growing together, our flock is growing, and... We're growing into a holy temple in the Lord. So that is ongoing, okay? And when we'll learn the technicalities on this. We're going to learn about a present participle that coincides with the main verb as opposed to the aorist participle that precedes the action of the main verb. 
So stay tuned as we get to that. And then, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's also ongoing. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool too. All right, so we'll break all those down. And, and I've, I've come to some conclusions related to uh, the corporate building that takes place, both with regard to the church universal and with regard to the local church. And I'll just, let, I'll just let that hang there, and you can think about it between now and Sunday, um, which one of these you think is church universal and which one of these you think is, is the local church. But we'll, uh, we'll come back to that. For tonight, though, we're still dealing with foundation, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, we know when the, uh, when the apostles and the prophets operated uh, from the resurrection of Christ to his ascension, uh, and, and essentially with uh, the birthday of the church being the day of Pentecost, 33 AD, we have the, the, the foundation starting there, okay? And are we still building a foundation 2,000 years later? Good heavens, no, Right? I mean, what kind, of, what, what kind of building is it that has 2,000 years of foundation laying? Uh, when, when do we stop building the foundation so we can put a structure on it? You know, if all you do is build foundation, foundation, foundation for 2,000 years, is this thing ever going to get built? So obviously the foundation was a limited, finite era. And that's why when we diagram the church age, I like to diagram the age of the apostles, the age of the local church that we have the early church, the apostolic age, was for the foundation. The New Testament being written and and the the Greek canon being added to the Hebrew canon of Scripture. That's foundation. But with the death of those apostles and prophets, uh, the apostle John's the last living apostle. He writes Revelation and he dies shortly thereafter. With the, the death of the last apostle, then the foundation is done. And we're now in the post-apostolic age of the, of the dispensation of the church. So, um, and this is the other diagram I put up every now and then. And uh, really, it's probably um, a bad idea to try to draw that to scale because the age of the apostles is about 70 years, Okay. 33 A.D., 96 A.D., so that's 63 years. Uh, and now the church age beyond that has been almost 2,000 years, right? So uh, to draw that to scale would be kind of silly. Uh, and likewise, the seven-year tribulation right there, not to scale, okay? Um, but this is why we, we do break down the church age into two parts. And we want to be very clear, and we want to be with our Pentecostal brethren and, and loved ones, that uh, they're, they're trying to function in charismatic Christianity, which was foundational and is now over and done with, okay? We've got we to be clear on the dispensational realities of why the apostles and prophets are not around anymore. Tongues and speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues and miracles and healings and all those prophetic utterances was for the foundation, not for the structure. So, foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. The apostles and prophets, this tells us it was not Old Testament. This tells us that Israel was not the church. Couldn't have been. They didn't have apostles and prophets. They had prophets, like they had judges and they had kings and they had prophets. But those Old Testament theocratic prophets are an entirely different animal from the New Testament ecclesiastical prophets. We've got to be clear on that. Don't confuse the, the terms. It's mildly unfortunate that, that we use the same word for both groups, okay? Because in the theocratic Old Testament, the prophet was, was, the, was, the, was the top dog. The prophet could, could chew out the king, could, could tell King David what not, and, and that he was God's spokesman. There was nobody over the prophet, But in the church age, consistently, it's apostles and prophets. Consistently, the office of prophet takes a secondary role to the office of the apostle. And the the New Testament prophets were not theocratic prophets. They didn't go tell, because the theocracy was being suspended. The, The program for Israel was being put on hold. Anyway, there's more to deal with that. Okay, so as far as foundation goes, I think we looked at the term thamelios, uh, Strong's number 2310. Uh, we don't have to do a whole lot with it. It means the same thing in English that it means in Greek, it means in Hebrew. We know what a foundation is. Um, the usages are, are 
curious because the metaphor can be applied in a, in a whole spectrum of applications. Uh, but Paul used it repeatedly in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, getting ready for the judgment seat of Christ, um, laying up a, a foundation for the future. When you're storing treasure in heaven, you're laying a foundation for the future. Uh, Hebrews 6 talks about laying a foundation. Uh, in, in a lot of times when you think about basic doctrinal studies, you think about the ABCs of the Christian faith. Let's pick up on that one. Hebrews 6, one, Because at the end of chapter 5, the author of Hebrews is rebuking his readers, telling them that they should be teachers by now. Telling them that they're, they've, uh, they're, they're, they're retarded. Okay? Literally in their educational advancement, that they have not grown the way they should have grown. By this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the ABCs, the stoicheia, right? You should be teachers, and you're still trying to learn the alphabet. What are you doing? And by now, you should be on solid food. And yet it says, you have come to need milk and not solid food. And this just gets blunt. This just lays it out there. That, you know, and we get that. Everybody gets that. We, we understand that, that a newborn, an infant, is going to be nursing at, at the mother's uh, breast. That's, that's the design. Uh, if you're still nursing when you're, when you're 55 years old, uh, that, that's a problem, okay? You, you, you should have been on solid food by now. You, don't, you, you would have been weaned a long time ago. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. And please pay attention. Maturity does not come by logging the number of Bible classes you've sat in. Maturity does not come through perception. Remember, it's perception and application of Bible doctrine. It's inhale and exhale. Some people just inhale, 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 and they never apply. They never exhale. And so they're puffed up with a bunch of knowledge that, that puffs up, and then it never edifies because they don't put it into practice. Notice, mature, who because of practice. And what kind of practice is this? Is, it, you know, um, <laughs> what doctrines do you regularly practice? You wake up in the morning and say, okay, today I'm going to practice the doctrine of uh, prosperity testing. Okay? We don't get to pick... <laughs> We don't get to pick what doctrines we're applying. We're going to apply all the doctrines we know depending on how we get tested. But the biggest testing application is training your senses to discern good and evil. So in your growth, in your doctrinal applications, not in your Bible class, not in the perception, but in the application, when your spiritual senses are trained and you start spotting things you should have spotted before. Okay, well, I'm spotting it now. Your sense is trained to discern good and evil. All right. Then, building on that rebuke, therefore, leaving the ABCs, the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation. Okay, you've got to get past the foundation. You've got to get past basic doctrinal studies. You've got to get past the, the foundation of your Christian walk. So it's the same vocabulary. It's the same word, but it's a different realm. It's a different application. This is our foundation of doctrine. And we can move on to deeper doctrines. Different uh, teachings there. All right. Hebrews 11.10. Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. I ponder this a lot. A city with foundations. I can understand a building with foundations. I can understand a, a, a temple or a structure. But an entire city with foundations? That's, that's curious to me. Tell me more. And um, how does this relate to the thing that descends out of heaven, normally foundations then get upward built. But this is coming down out of heaven. All right, oh, tell me more. I want to I learn more. And then uh, Revelation 21. 
The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. On them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Uh, the gates are named after the tribes of Israel, and the foundation stones are named after the, the uh, apostles of the Lamb. So this is a city that has uh, provided for both Israel and church blessings. Israel and the church will share blessings in this city based upon the gates that are named after the uh, tribes and the foundation stones that are named after the apostles, apostles of the Lamb. All right. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. This phrase, apostles and prophets, it's always in that order. It's like Batman and Robin. You never have Robin and Batman. Uh, you always have cowboys and Indians. You never have Indians and cowboys. Okay? I don't know who makes up these rules, but you know, we're stuck with them. We always have apostles and prophets. There, there's never been an apostle that ever had to answer to an, a prophet that he was traveling with. That's not how it works. The, the apostles would take prophets with them Silvanus was a prophet that traveled with Paul. There were other uh, prophets that would travel. Agabus was a prophet. There were other uh, New Testament prophets. But it was always apostles as, as the top level. The apostles were the ones that had representative authority of Jesus Christ himself. And so the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, very clear. And, and just... Run through these verses, learn them, show them to anybody that's asking these kind of questions. This is, there is no way Israel could have ever even dreamed of this because their stewardship preceded the apostles and the prophets. All right, I mentioned spiritual gifts earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You are all Christ's body and individually members of it. Okay? This is the nature of the church. We're a corporate body in Christ. Each one of us is a, a body part that fits with the other body parts. You are Christ's body collectively and individually members of Christ's body. And God has appointed in the church first apostles. Okay? That's the first appointment. That's the first. When the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost and in that upper room, who was in that upper room? The apostles, okay? So they're the first ones spirit-imbued, first ones vested as church-age believer priests, the first spiritual gifts that were granted and operational. Second, prophets, okay? And, and these, are the, these are the ordinal or ordinal? Cardinal. Ordinal numbers, first, second, third, okay? I always get that mixed up. But first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then. And then we get past first, second, third, and then it's just then, 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 then. Um, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. So the, the, the prioritization of the spiritual giftedness of the church age starts here. And by the way, most of those aren't even around anymore. Apostles, prophets, we still have teachers. Miracles are gone. Healing is gone. We still have helps, administrations. We still have various kinds of tongues. Those are gone. Okay? And those ended before the canon was complete because that was a different criteria. Tongues shall cease, whereas prophecy is done away. Anyway, we got notes on that if you want. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 14. We explain why the temporary gifts were temporary, why they ceased or were done away. Uh, uh, accordingly. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? I think he's making a point here, okay? The redundancy is rhetorical. It's, in, it's intentional. It's designed to, to, uh, to drive it in there. This foundation is being built, and the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, okay? I had a book recommended to me, and it's all about uh, retro Christianity, I think is in the title. And it's about everything we're doing wrong as 21st century American evangelicals. And if we really want to do church right, we need to emulate the church fathers. We need to go back to the first century. We need to go back to our roots. Because until we do, then we're just going to keep doing everything wrong. And, of course, the fallacy in that, in that concept is that they did a lot wrong in the first century. <laughs> okay? Which is why... 1 Corinthians was written, and 2 Corinthians, and, and all the rebuking that the apostles had to do. 
But these authors have this romantic uh, attachment to, the, to the, the, the church fathers and think, well, they were, they were closest to the apostles. They had to be closest to truth. They got a lot wrong. And so we don't want to go back to that. We, w- we want to build on that. We, we have the advantage of 20 centuries of theological development. Praise God for that. I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't trade 21st century uh, theology for all the bumps in the road that got us to where we are now. Anyway, so a foundation and uh, apostles and prophets in that order, first and second in verse 28, first and second in verse 29. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? Of course not. And today in the church age, there aren't any more. They're done. They're gone. The apostle Paul was last of all. Nobody was ever called to apostolic office after Paul's calling on the Damascus Road. Everybody else that was an apostle was called prior to that because Paul said, last of all, he appeared to me as one untimely born. So, we've got to be clear on these things. Uh, It's not only Ephesians 2.20 that talks about the foundation of the apostles and prophets, but when we cross into chapter 3, again, we're going to see this. He says, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men. That's a clue. It's even bigger than Israel's stewardship. It even was kept hidden from the Gentiles and their stewardship. It was not revealed. This mystery doctrine was was reserved for the church. Not revealed to the Gentile prophets, not revealed to the Jewish prophets, and not revealed in in the Hebrew canon. In other generations was not made known to the Son of Man as it has now, the present generation, the living saints of Paul's day and age, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Okay? That's the foundation. The church has its foundation in this living generation of apostles and prophets. Contemporaries with Uh, as Paul's phrasing it here in this verse, contemporaneous with his own ministry and his own writings. This is is vital. This is where, um, if anybody doubts the the reliability of the New Testament, uh, the the Vodi Bauckham quote is is marvelous. Just just lay it out there. The New Testament was written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. You know, why do we find that it's reliable? Why do we find that, why why are we persuaded that the, the New Testament communicates truth. And, and we do so on a very rational basis. In fact, the evidence for it is so overwhelming that rejection of New Testament reliability is irrational. Those who reject the, 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 the record of his death and burial and resurrection as recorded in the New Testament, it's an irrational rejection of what should rationally be the reliable testimony of the New Testament. So, in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed. And here he's writing Ephesians, and you know we can we can ballpark the uh, the uh, the estimated date on this: fifty six A D, fifty seven A D, just in that in that range, fifty eight A D. You know, I'll be I'll be uh, flexible within a couple of years there, late fifties. It has now been revealed. Mystery doctrine is being unfolded to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. Again, what's what's the foundation? Apostles and prophets. When we get into uh, the next chapter, 411, Jesus uh, is giving gifts. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so every believer priest in the church age, every member of that's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, every church stone, that, such as you and I, every one of us is gifted. That didn't happen in the Old Testament, but it happens now. And it happens now because he is victorious. He is ascended. He, is himself, he has himself received gifts. He, he is now giving gifts. Well, we're going to do some work with this because the quotation out of Psalms actually... Uh, tweaks the quotation, Psalm 68, where he's giving gifts. In Psalms, he's receiving gifts. Okay? We're cool with this. 
but it's a change the Holy Spirit made. The same Holy Spirit who wrote Psalms is now uh, inspiring Ephesians. So, um, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that also he has descended into the lower parts of the earth. So he descended into the virgin birth, and then after his physical death, he descended into Sheol. And he who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all things, so that he might fill all things. Remember, he's the one who fills. And we'll be, we have these filling doctrines we're studying because of the fullness of time and the, uh, the church being the fullness of him who fills. And notice, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets. What are the first two gifts that are mentioned there? Apostles and prophets. The same two gifts we had in chapter 3. The same two gifts we had in chapter 2. The same two gifts that are the foundation gifts the foundation stones of this building we call the church. And then he gave some as pastors and teachers, or evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. So this, this verse will take some exegesis. We'll talk about Granville Sharp. We'll break down the some ases. There's only four some ases. The fourth some as is the combined pastors and teachers. And these are... Um, if you understand how the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to individual believers, it's also important to know how Jesus Christ gives gifted believers to specific lampstands. So we have the evangelists and the pastor teachers here at Austin Bible Church that Jesus has gifted us with. And thank God for that. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, the building up of the body of Christ. Oh, and in case you missed it, the apostles and prophets, that's foundational. The evangelists and the pastor teachers, is that foundational? No, it's ongoing. It's the, it's the current construction project of going on. And like I say, I hope we're doing the roof right now. I'm hoping we're doing the final touch of the roof. I'm hoping we're putting the, the steeple on top of the roof. I hope we have uh, maybe a, a little rooster weather vane thing up there, whatever. You know, just the final finishing touches to wrap up this church and to rapture us out of here. Hmm. I was talking to Pastor Jay Rarey the other day and I told him I want to be the one that leads the final believer to Christ. And he says, well, what if it's more than one? You keep talking about the final one. What if the final one is actually the final 100 and they all get led to Christ simultaneously at, a, at, a, at an event, at a Billy Graham rally or at a, some kind of a uh, a, a thing. You might not just lead the final one, that, but that one could be in a group of, of 50 or a group of 100 or something that all get saved simultaneously in the same event, and then the trumpet sounds. He says, wouldn't that be a better story? <laughs> okay, I'll tell that story forever. I still want to be the evangelist that uh, is the tool in God's hands to, to see that happen. All right, so we have uh, 1 Corinthians 12, we have Ephesians 2, Ephesians 3, Ephesians 4. We also have Revelation 18, 20. You think, Revelation 18, 20? Wait a minute, stop, hold the door. I'm, I'm, wait, you're scaring me here, Pastor. You told me that the church is not in the tribulation, that the church is in chapter 2 and 3, and then you don't see the church anywhere after chapter 3 in the tribulation. Okay, you're correct. You don't see the church on earth during the tribulation. But you do see uh, crowned uh, heroes in heaven. I believe that's the church. You do see other church representations in heaven because Christ is in heaven and thus we shall always be with the Lord. My theory is, is that after the rapture of the church, wherever Jesus is, we are. Because thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, Doctrinal conclusion from 1 Thessalonians 4. And so, yes, this is tribulation on earth, and Revelation 18 is the fall of commercial Babylon, and it's, it's horrible. Everybody's crying out. It's sad. Whoa, whoa, the great city. And um, in one hour, she's devastated. What city is like the great city? Whoa, whoa. And, um, but notice, while the earth dwellers are crying out, whoa, whoa, the command is given, rejoice over her, O heaven. So this doesn't violate the rule that the church is not seen on earth during the tribulation. 
The church is actually seen in heaven during the tribulation. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints. Remember, I mentioned, be careful with saints. Because holy ones could be angels, holy ones could be Old Testament saints, holy ones could be Gentile saints, holy ones could be Old Testament Israel saints. But notice who else is here in heaven? And apostles and prophets. Because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. I actually think that these are church age saints with the apostles and prophets uh, providing the leadership in this, uh, in this hallelujah chorus, in the, uh, in the rejoicing that's going to take place. <coughs> but God has pronounced judgment for you against her. And that's the downfall of uh, commercial Babylon. All right, note the significant distinction between the prophets of Israel and the apostles and prophets of the church. Just because the word prophet is there, don't confuse a church age of prophet uh, or prophetess with Old Testament prophets of Israel. And they also are, are mentioned, by the way, Peter talks about them. Second Peter uh, chapter 3. This now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Isn't that great? Repetition is edifying. And uh, it's not a problem to repeat something that you've already said. That you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets. So don't throw away your Old Testament. Don't ignore the Hebrew canon. But then also the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. And so we have the blessing to have the Old Testament foundation and then the New Testament to build on that foundation. Anyway, uh, but these holy prophets here are Moses and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel, all of the, the, the writing prophets of the, of the Hebrew canon. So don't forget that. The word spoken beforehand you learn a lot from those. You can process those. You can see then the fulfillments there. And then the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. So yeah, don't confuse. Just because the word prophet, there were prophets of Israel before, the, before Jesus. And then and he himself was a prophet. Jesus himself, prophet, priest, and king. He was a theocratic prophet of Israel. But don't confuse that prophetic office with the church age office of the apostles and the prophets. So keep those straight. Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Now, I think it's useful that we have the reminder like in Hebrews 3.1, Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession. So I don't have any problem with, if, if the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, I don't have any problem with Jesus being the cornerstone, the chief foundation stone, because he is also the apostle and high priest of our confession. Some people don't like this. And some people try to, in fact, the critics of dispensationalism will very frequently, this is one of their avenues of approach. And they will say, well, you, you dispensationalists, you tell us that the church begins at Pentecost, but Jesus wasn't here then. Jesus was in heaven already. So how could he be the, the foundation of the church if he wasn't even here to build the church? Well, stop. First of all, it's a silly objection, but I'll answer it if you really want me to. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession, and he's very active in the church age from heaven. That the church age is very much an interaction between heaven and earth. What, what we bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. What we loose on earth has already been loosed in heaven. We have a heavenly, earthly dynamic throughout the church age. And he sent the Holy Spirit to, to uh, indwell the, the humans on the earth, the believers on the earth. And so in his headship, as head of the church, sending the Holy Spirit was his first church age act. Seated at the right hand of God in session. Okay? I don't know if you pay attention to death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and session of Jesus Christ. That session cannot be overlooked. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he is functioning as the head of the church in session. Anyway, and here he is, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Jesus Christ himself. So 
again, for anybody that's, that's trying to be a covenant guy, trying to be, uh, you know, a good, faithful, uh, muddy the waters kind of guy, trying to just mash all of the people of God into one category of uh, happy kumbaya believers, okay? No, the church did not exist in the Old Testament. It could not exist until Christ was seated at the Father's right hand, until the Holy Spirit was sent to baptize members into personal union with the victorious, risen, seated Savior. Okay? There is no way that the church could have preceded uh, Pentecost of, of 33 AD. So, Christ himself being the cornerstone. On this rock I will build my church. He told Peter that. Peter's great confession, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. Bingo. On this confession, on this rock, I will build my church. And this is what Jesus has been doing ever since Pentecost. He sent the Holy Spirit and he began this construction process, himself being the cornerstone, the other apostles and prophets being foundation stones. So Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Now, when we get to cornerstone language, being the cornerstone, capstone, foundation. It's different ways you can render this from the Hebrew, from the Old Testament, and then obviously this is a Greek quotation. But um, the, uh, the, the, the foundation level requires it to be a corner, requires it to be a ground floor corner. Um, in other Old Testament passages, I think the language of a capstone is, is fitting. I think in some of the, the Job passages, for example, the, the, the structure there, I, is, I agree with Clarence Larkin, the, 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 um, the, the capstone there is the very top stone of the pyramid. And, and that's the one that's kind of set aside until it's needed. It's the last stone you need to put at the top of your pyramid. So uh, if you ever read the writings of Clarence Larkin when he goes into the, the uh, rebuke of Job there, I think uh, God was rebuking Job for his pride and using pyramid construction language to, uh, to humble him. That's a, that's a, a curious detail. But, uh, so capstone may be valid there, but I don't take this as capstone because it's foundational. And he's the chief cornerstone of the foundation. And that's a much better uh, metaphor to understand the imagery on this. All right, let me tease this so that when we come back to it on Sunday, you know what we're dealing with here. Because it comes out of Psalm 118, it comes out of Isaiah, it comes out of other Old Testament passages. Really, we have a medley of Old Testament texts from Psalms to Isaiah that get brought together by Paul, by Peter, by Jesus, in, uh, and by Luke in Acts 4. We've got um, other links here. Where do I pick up on this? Goodness. Okay, I'm not going to read the whole Psalm 118, but I do want to tease it and get you guys excited to come back on Sunday. All right, open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. Open to me the gates of righteousness. If you're looking for some Old Testament gospel call passages, um, this would be a good one to start with. Open to me the gates of righteousness. So here's an Old Testament unbeliever ready to get saved. Adapted for that kind of a use. Um, this is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it. I shall give thanks to you for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. When Jesus told Nicodemus he must be born again, that should not have been an alien concept to him. Shocking how many uh, religious leaders didn't know the first thing about being born again. So you got a great gospel call right there, giving thanks to eternal salvation, entering through gates of righteousness. Now notice, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now this is, I think it's Davidic, Psalm 118. Maybe it's Davidic, maybe it's not. But regardless, this is not a newsflash to um, Calvary of 33 A.D., this is not a shock and a surprise. God wasn't up there in heaven scratching his head saying, oh goodness, they crucified my Christ. What do I do now? He knew it. He called for it. He designed it. 
He, Jesus was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, and he wrote about it when he said, the cornerstone will be rejected. The builders rejected it, and it now has become the chief cornerstone. By virtue of its rejection, now what's it doing? Okay? And then when you process this and you understand this, as again, it's another nail in the coffin for replacement theology. I think. I think it just shows the glories of God's plan, which is his eternal purpose, not his backup plan. Okay? The eternal purpose, which he brought about in Christ. So stay tuned. We'll come back to this Sunday morning. Lord willing and rapture penny. But this is where we get do, Lord. Uh, do save, we beseech you. We beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. All right. So we've got some fun stuff to look at. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for truth. Help us to understand these blessings. Help us to know them. Help us to live them. We thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Costs associated with such grace provision are paid in full by grace-oriented, born-again believers in Jesus Christ. Motivated by God the Holy Spirit, well-pleasing to God the Father. More information on our grace-giving policy and your opportunity to join in this Grace Financial Fellowship can be found at the link in the description below.